Hello and welcome to another episode of Architecture for Kids podcast. I'm your host, Antonio Caplan. I'm a trained architect, an architectural educator and founding director of award-winning Architecture for Kids CIC. In this podcast, I'm going to talk to practitioners and creatives that share the same passion as I do, to inspire and to engage children and young people to shape their built environment and the creative industries. The podcast is brought to you in collaboration with the Built Environment Trust, the Thornton Education Trust and the Wells School of Architecture, Cardiff University. My guest today is Grant Smith, the Education and Outreach Officer at Temple Bar Trust, where he runs a program of primary school visits with RAND 300, as well as talks and walks from Temple Bar highlighting the architecture of the city, both heritage and modern to a diverse audience. Grant is an Australian-born photographer residing in London, and he has an extensive knowledge of London's architecture. He has photographed the construction of the O2, Terminal 5, the Gherkin and the Scalpel. Current projects include photographing the City of London Police Building in Fleet Street, Space House Refurbishment, and the House of Fraser site in Victoria. Grant, thank you for coming to talk to me today, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. Thanks, Antonio. Uh, That introduction was pretty well spot on and does cover a lot of the uh, things that I managed to do in the daytime. What was your favourite subject at school, and what were you good at? Favourite subject is a question I haven't been asked for a long time, and I have to think back. Uh, I would probably say maths and geography. Uh, and I've also, you know, I have a real interest in history, so I'm sure that was uh, uh, an interesting subject for me at school. Uh, I did well in the sciences at school. They were the subjects that I excelled in. Yeah, and I think, say, with photography, a friend of mine was commented that it's this blend of uh, art and science, and it's the science, certainly when I was working and processing film and printing in the laboratory, you got the the chemical or scientific side of, of photography and the artistic side is when you're out taking the photographs or even back in the dark frame, you're looking at how the uh, negatives should have been cropped. That was my next question. If it's the subjects that you were enjoying and that you were good at, if it were used in your career or, you know, in your future. Exactly. Look, and I think um, the, the other thing that really stimulated my, my interest in the environment was when I arrived in uh, Europe at the end of, 1982, and I had a checklist of um, structures from and uh, paintings and artworks, sculpture and so on from antiquity and you know the great masters, the old masters that I wanted to see, uh, and so I worked through that as I travelled through Europe and then eventually arriving in London. But importantly, before that, I stopped in Paris and stayed there for a couple of months and was struck by this extraordinary building in the centre of Paris. Uh, I knew nothing about the architect and I came across this building, which was, of course, the Pompidou Centre. Uh, and uh, I thought, always thought that and the Sydney Opera House were one of the most significant buildings that made an impact on me. The Pompidou, just to, to bring that story to a close, it was, uh, the, uh, there was an exhibition uh, about 10 years ago at the Pompidou on Richard Rogers' work which then travelled to the Royal Academy, and I had several photographs in the exhibition, so it was quite a nice closing of that circle. And I'm looking forward to going back to the Pompidou to see the Fosber exhibition, where I also have some photographs in that one. You are an education and outreach officer at uh, the Temple Bar Trust. What does the Temple Bar Trust do, and what do you do? The Temple Bar Trust is a charity set up by the Worshipful Company of Chartered Architects, which is a livery company in the City of London, uh, was established in 1983, uh, and it's um, one of over 100 livery companies in the city. It's a fairly new one. Temple Bar Trust has been established to promote uh, uh, an interest in architecture and the built environment to students, tourists, local community, anybody that's interested, and we're trying to reach uh, a wider audience so that more people have some accessibility to understanding architecture, particularly the architecture in the City of London. 
on that is that heritage architecture, you go back to Wren's architecture or Hawke's Mall, uh, and of course it's Wren's uh, 300th anniversary of his death this year, so there's a lot of commemorative events, but also looking at the modern architecture and new developments. And, and the city really is a unique place to understand and see that huge variety of architecture from uh, uh, the Roman Wall, which is visible below a car park on, on London Wall, right through to buildings that are open. Some are open last month, some are going to be finished next year and the year after that and so on. It's a continually evolving environment and there's nowhere else that uh, in the world. Temple Bar Trust, what did they offer? So there's a program of, of uh, walks we do monthly, sometimes a couple of times a month. There are talks by leading practitioners in architecture. Uh, we've had um, the architects from BIG group they talked about the development in um, King's Cross and, and Fleet Street. Uh, we have Ray de Graaf from OMA coming in October. Victoria Thornton will be talking about her work. I've got Gus O'Doll, cabinet secretary, former cabinet secretary, to talk about working in the buildings of government. So they're the series of talks which are accessible to anyone. And you go to the website and you can see all the details. We also run walks around the city, and I have several planned uh, called In Common, so using that theme to, to pick up on that as we lead walks around the city. And as part of the education program, I'm working with REN 300, getting primary school students at Key Stage 1 who are learning about the Great Fire of London and Christopher Wren, and they come into Temple Bar uh, we split them up into groups and they do activities like quill pen writing or building with blocks, learning about the fire. And I do that twice a week and I end up usually with 60 children on, on both Monday and Friday, which is quite a lot of fun. Now that's the, that's the primary school part of it. Sorry to interrupt you, but uh, just to be clear, the REN 300 is the name of the program. Yes, REN 300 has been set up by the London Diocese Fund. Okay. And they're working with uh, other churches, but uh, they approached me sometime uh, at the end of last year, and we started to talk about the idea of got on very well and thought this fits perfectly with the aims of Temple Bar Trust. We, we provide the space for free, uh, and the school booked through the REN 300 site, which we intend to carry that on into next year, so it'll be REN 301 and REN 302 and so on. There's no reason to stop because it's been very successful. And we're reaching um, a lot of schools that uh, uh, there are some dis quite a few disadvantaged schools that come to us. And the other thing that's very interesting about the program is that a lot of kids, a lot of school children, they haven't been anywhere for a couple of years because of the pandemic. So for many of them, this is the first time out of the classroom. And to see the expression on some of those children's faces is really rewarding. And the schools are around the area where you where, where the temple? Not necessarily. We've had schools from, well, we've had schools from Islington. We've had them from Hampstead, from Romford, uh, Battersea. So it's I really know then. Yeah, it, it, there's no, uh, there's no barrier. This was your graphic. Yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, I I did. I went to a function uh, this week, and I was talking to a, a head teacher who's based in Essex. Unfortunately, places like that, it's a little too far because they don't benefit from the free transport, and they have to get private transport in, which makes the transport costs prohibitive for some of the children. So it does tend to be within London. What does this program entail? So what is the aims of the program and what what is a typical sort of workshop with these kids? Oh, okay. Well, the kids will come into the, uh, come into Temple Bar. I'll break them downstairs and get them to identify shapes and types of buildings before I take them into uh, the room upstairs in Temple Bar. And there they learn about the, the fire with a, an interactive map of, of uh, medieval London. And after that, they are they're, uh, uh, handling things like telescopes and cool pens and magnifying glasses and sundials, all of which Christopher Wren either deployed or invented in his life. And then some of them, we split them up and some of them work with building blocks, others write with a cool pen. They, at the end of the sessions, they have their lunch there. They go off to St. Vegas Church 
which is a, a, a Wren church also, and they dress up as Christopher Wren, the stonemason, or some of the people that were around at that time. And the funniest thing, I was with a group of children on Monday this week photographing them, and the howls of laughter were one of the children first puts on the Christopher Wren wig and that long flowing rig that comes below their shoulders. All of their classmates were just in fits and I was supposed to be taking pictures, but I was laughing so hard. It was such a joy to see that. And so the children in those uh, sessions get experience with drama because they're acting like Christopher Wren and the, the teacher will say to them, well, strut around like Christopher Wren and you should see them. It's like they're method acting. Yeah. They're very funny. And, and then earlier in Temple Bar, of course, writing with cool pen, it's, it uh, embraces artwork, uh, powers of observation, or learning to see and to translate that onto the page. And then when they're building with uh, blocks, it's, uh, it's a lesson in, in cooperation and working together and communication with their small group they're working on. So it does address a lot of those educational updates. Are you trying to align this program with, with a curriculum or are you just doing your own thing? No, no, this is aligned with the curriculum because at Key Stage 1, uh, the children are learning about the Great Fire now, in London. We want to develop this into Key Stage 2 when the children are a little bit older and they're learning more about things like, say, design and awareness of the environment. The majority of the kids, or, or you know, so in, in your experience, what is, uh, what is their understanding of architecture? Do they do they know or have they been ex sort of exposed to architecture or do they because what, what is the experience um yeah, that's a good question um for some of them architecture the word is maybe the first time they've heard that word yeah and they're they're in the class uh but they do they might not be able to understand the elements of architecture but perhaps they will go away recognizing that for example st paul's cathedral was completed by one of, our, one of the greatest English architects. So I think the understanding of architectural components and so on is really in the key stage too. So the key stage one is more about, you know, the change in London and the fire and so on. And the, and the fact that Christopher Wren produced a plan for the fire, uh, for the redevelopment, rebuilding of the city some four or five days after the fire. The, the lessons also talk about history because the children will learn about, obviously, the Great Fire, as I said, but also the um, there's a little bit about the Civil War and Wren's patronage by Charles II because as young children, they possibly played together. So there's a, an historical element to it. There's a little uh, rhyme that the teachers have devised for the children. Sir Christopher Wren, an architect and a, and a genius with his pen, do you have a mentoring program as well? No, not as such. We haven't got a mentoring program, but well, but not a formal one. Uh, they do run events for college students of uh, architecture, so there'll be uh, what part one, part two, etc. And I will arrange for three architects or so to come in to talk to these uh, kids. I mean, they're older, but there's some of them are in their twenties. They're already studying architecture, but not necessarily working with a practice. So I will, um, the, the architects will talk about their journey. So I've had uh, senior architects, I've had the master of the architect's company, Chris Dyson, come in and he talks to them. He'll talk about the company and about his practice. I have another uh, friend of mine who's uh, of Bangladeshi descent. He's talked about his journey into architecture. And the idea is that the students who are coming in are from colleges that don't necessarily have access to that privileged world of architecture. So, for example, I, I met a, a tutor at University of East London who said that some of his students are working at Amazon or at a service station to put themselves through college rather than working in an architectural practice because they don't know anybody. If they come along to the events that I hold... Uh, and they leave with a phone number, one or two people leave with a phone number, not necessarily to get a job, but just to help them on their journey not to architecture. Exactly. The other thing, a lot of these students are perhaps from families that don't recognise architecture as a profession. They might be thinking of medicine or law, but not necessarily about architecture. So that's 
that's a, an event that I put on every couple of months and and provide pizza and drinks for them. And so, and how do you advertise these events? Uh, how can people find out more? For sure. Uh, well, that's all through the Temple Bar dot London website. We also promote it through the uh, Company of Architects website. So we have student members there, and I also go directly to the colleges. So uh, if any colleges uh, are interested in, in learning about the program, I would urge them to please get in touch uh, through the website and, and I can respond to that and allocate so many spaces for the students. I mean, the, the capacity of the hall is about 45, so it tends to be a small group. Um, but look, everybody that goes really enjoys the, the event because, you know, they do hear about the practicalities of architecture, I've got uh, John Asale from Asale Architecture. He will come in and talk about, you know, how to prepare for getting a, a job in architecture or he'll talk about his practices work with art and uh, with artists and, and so on. So they get a different perspective on things. Uh, and those architects, the speakers, are always available afterwards for the students to talk to them. Yes, it becomes like a mentor, really. That, that it, yes. And, and the other thing I've done is had uh, students from, uh, there's a year 12 students from Lewisham, working with Lewisham Challenge, and these students really might not have much idea what they're going to do next year you know, when they go into further education. And I've had uh, the, the representative from Lewisham Challenge, and I've had uh, an architect, I had three types of engineers, a civil, a structural, and a bioengineer, all women under the age of 30, all incredibly talented, uh, talk to these children about their journeys. A lot of these kids, they don't, they go through school, and there's no uh, talking about architecture or the creative industries careers as a, as a potential. And, and, you know, and, and often they just decided with the marks. I had a student uh, this year that turned around to me and said, I wanted to be a vet, but I didn't have good enough marks to be a vet, so architecture was the, the other option. Interesting. I mean, Christopher Wren actually worked as a, as a veterinary surgeon for a while before he was an architect, so maybe that student follows that journey. I, I think it is interesting at that stage because a lot of these students at that event really didn't have any idea about what they wanted. But interesting, interestingly enough, of the four speakers, as they're an architect and three engineers, it was only the architect that knew what she wanted to do. The engineers weren't really sure. And one woman who was the civil engineer has gone on to have an extraordinary career working in transport infrastructure, and that she's with uh, Mott McDonald. So it, it doesn't really matter if you don't know. You yeah. will find out. And I think a lot of us still don't know what we want to do and how we want to spend that. It's important also for what we were talking about earlier, which is to open up the conversation about architecture. This is what I say when I work with and kids and young people. It's like, look, I'm not here in a crusader to turn you into architects or designers. What I want you is to just participate in the conversation and to know that, you know, what you have to say is important and it can change things. And you can only do that coming from an informed stance. Absolutely right. And it's not just about architecture. I, I prefer to see it, as I think most of us do, as the built environment. And that can involve town planning, it's civil engineering, structural engineering. There's all sorts of disciplines within that, within that sphere. But in terms of running this program, you know, at the Temple Bar Trust, what are the challenges? What is the relevance and, and the impact? Well, the challenge is, is the obvious one, and that's funding. That's always a challenge, isn't it? Uh, perhaps another interesting challenge is with the student nights, getting them to turn up on time. And, and also, I, th I think, securing the, the lecturers, although the lecturers that I've engaged or the, the, the speakers have all come from the, the company of architects, so they're, they're willing to put their time into things. Uh, other challenges are... Uh, well, to begin with, coming into Temple Bar, it was uh, access to uh, uh, an office building and uh, there was a stairway that wasn't deemed safe for six or seven-year-old children, so we had to spend a lot of money installing a balustrade so that children wouldn't fall through the stairway. So that, they become practical challenges, our health and safety. And this is uh, it's interesting, the environment we're in, it's on Paternoster Square, and that is all business. Though the stop exchanges are one side, 
Uh, there are other, you know, uh, commercial tenants on the square. So a bunch of school children turning up, 30 school children, is quite a different uh, phenomenon in that environment. You mentioned something uh, quite interesting, which is uh, getting the, uh, the kids to turn up on time. Is it turn up on time or turn up altogether? Uh, no, it's turning up on time, essentially. Some of them do arrive, and uh, I've had one student arrive after the talk was finished, but he wanted to come in to meet the architects that were there. So, I, I, I look, I respect that. I think probably I was running the programs a little too early in the day. Uh, I need to allow for students that are, uh, are working on their projects and allow them time to get into the city. So, that that's a minor. There's a lot of programs that have been set up for after school and and if this and this is not connected with the schools it gets very difficult to get the kids to show up and to participate and and that's kind of I was wondering if that is kind of the experience that you were talking about no no it's not because uh the the lecturers at the colleges and I've got a good relationship with uh Kingston College and uh UEL University of East London and the, the tutors there are on board. And, yeah. and so they see that as a, a positive thing for the students to do, most yeah. definitely. And uh, I've had students in from Kingston uh, one afternoon and they, the tutor was holding a crit session at Temple Bar, which was wonderful because the whole room was, uh, there was about 10 or 12 students there and all the tables were, were full of these uh, drawings. And all at one, yeah, I was read really something to be part of that, uh, education and actually having some inputs and uh, and allowing uh, providing that facility for students. When was the Temple Bar Trust set up? The Temple Bar came back into the city. In the, the Temple Bar structure came back into the city in two thousand and three. The Worshipful Company, the Company of Architects, was set up in ni- in nineteen eighty three. Yeah, so the Temple Bar Trust is a fairly new iteration. We have a we have a. Chair of Trustees, who is uh, Peter Murray, and there are about eight trustees. So, and they act really as a sort of guide to where Temple Bar. And what are the future plans? Yes, we do. We we also have a commercial arm to Temple Bar Trust, and we're uh, upgrading the Temple Bar Chamber inside the interior of Wren's structure. Uh, in fact, this morning I was letting the contractors in who are there going to be painting. We're installing a new lighting system, chandelier to make them a little more empathetic towards an 18th century dining room. But we want to continue. The, 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 that, that refurbishment program will enable us to uh, provide a more atmospheric place for private dining. And so that's revenue generating. The educational program, yes, I do want to continue that, as I said, into 23, 24 and so on. There's no reason why it should stop. And I do like the idea of, um, well, we've had Open City, their Accelerate program came in and used Temple Bar as a workspace. Yesterday, uh, there was a group of architects, Matthew Lloyd architects, who used the space uh, as an away date. So they were in the Temple Bar chamber. They had all their mobile phones uh, locked away. There's no internet in that room, so they were able to sit down and talk, and that was really enjoyable So uh, and very successful for that practice. So we want to do more things like that. It is available you know, for people to stage events like that, but that obviously is at a cost, but the, the educational work, uh, we're, we're, the access to that is, is free. Yeah. So well, I do want to continue that. Educa- I look forward to more programs of more speakers. At the moment, as I said, we're doing one a month, sometimes two. We're running a, a program of films that are related to architecture. Last week we had a film on the architecture of Jeffrey Bauer, the Sri Lankan architect, introduced by the filmmaker. So we want to have more of those programs, so films that you wouldn't see at the cinema. Do you think that uh, in terms of uh, architecture and in terms of the profession, uh, do you think things are changing and uh, in which way are they changing if they are? And uh, how important do you think is uh, to listen to young people's voices to, to help that change? And well, a uh, very complex question. I don't know if I'm really qualified to answer all of that. But certainly engaging young people in architecture is is really key. Alistair Campbell, who was talking at 
the Hay Festival advocating bringing politics early on into education in school. And why not do the same thing with architecture, making children aware? And it might just be understanding shapes and why are things that shape. All industries are pushing for, you know, their industry to be taught quite earlier on. Yeah. Uh, 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 within. Because let's face it, the educational system has to change. Yeah. This was, nobody needs to go to school to learn history. You can just Google it. You need to understand the principles of study. Yes, uh, absolutely right. But then the best way to learn is hands-on, is project-based. Yeah. And yeah. that's kind of really where you're going to get your knowledge and you're going to find out about things and you're going to get enthusiastic because that's also where you're going to live your life and your professional life. We need to change the educational system. Yeah. I, I, I think the thing is, I mean, I've been teaching at, at City Lit, I've uh, been teaching adult learners and... The, the the thing you realize there, you never stop learning. So as long as you're happy to do that, you're going to continue to grow intellectually and, and, and in many other ways as well. Do you want to do your photography? Do you photographing anything exciting at the moment? Yeah, I've got a couple of big projects. One is the new City of London Police Court Complex in uh, Fleet Street, which has been designed by Eric Parry, which is a huge scheme, being finished in about five years' time. So they're at piling stage at the moment. And the other one I'm doing is the old ha- House of Fraser store in Victoria Street. And that's an interesting job because the whole building is being demolished. But as much as is possible from that demolition is being recycled. The building's just been raised to the ground. But even like the fittings from the House of Fraser store, they either gave to a fashion schools or tried to sell off. All of the core of the electrical components are all being stripped out and that's all being recycled. And going onto site there to photograph that, there are different piles for all these different types of material. I've never seen that before. Usually it all just went into a skit. So it's quite something. So it's going to be, you know, it's a big building to take down. It's a big footprint, um, but it's a very interesting way that those demolition contractors are doing it. So that's also, I think, a real a real change in how things are being done now. Yes, yes. And you know, as you are Australian, it just made me think the first business that I know that does this kind of recycling is in Australia. No, really. They have this huge warehouse yeah. where you go and you can buy doors, you can buy pieces of walls, yeah. bits of walls. Is that in Melbourne or Sydney? And why not? Is that a question I should have asked you and I haven't? What was that question? Maybe who would we like to be talking at Temple Bar next? I think would be a a good question like Rem Corliss, some I like that, yeah, or Bokanabe architect Francis Kerre. Uh, I think somebody like that that would bring a different take on it. It was very interesting. I'll tell you, I went to a, a, a talk about Ren in the city as part of Ren 300, and there was uh, Amanda Levite, Rab Bennett's, an architect from Foster's, and the architect that designed the Pavilion at the Serpentine, designed in 2021 by Samaya Valley. They were all asked to name their favourite architect. So Rab, quote, uh, names Hopkins. Amanda Levy names uh, Le Cabusier. The architect from Foster's name, Norman Foster. And Samaya, she named uh, Amali, uh, an architect from Mali that had designed all these uh, mud mosques. So it's a completely different way of seeing things, and that's what I would like to bring to it too. Thank you very much, Antonio. And as I said, uh, if you want to know anything about Temple Bar Trust, it's all on the website, templebartrust.london. Thank you very much to my guest today, to all the listeners, and please subscribe to Architecture for Kids podcast and leave your rating and a review. Recommend us to your friends and family. And to find out more about it, visit our websites, antoniocaplan-portfolio.co.uk, buildingcenter.co.uk, thorntoneducationtrust.org, cardiff.ac.uk. And follow us on Instagram, arch4kidscic, Twitter, and Kaplan. LinkedIn and Kaplan, C-A-P-E-L-A-O. And please join me again next week for another episode of Architecture for Kids podcast, brought to you in collaboration with the Built Environment Trust, the Thornton Education Trust, and the Welsh School of Architecture, Cardiff University.